What are prostaglandins? Well, according to Stats Pearl's article from Kashif Malik and Anterpreet Dua, titled, quote, prostaglandins, unquote, prostaglandins are a group of naturally occurring fatty acid compounds that have several important functions in the body. They are produced in almost all tissues and organs and are derived from erythrodonic acid. Prostaglandins help regulate biological processes such as inflammation, blood flow, the formation of blood clots, and even the induction of child labor. So, women in the audience, you know, I guess you can thank prostaglandins for helping you deliver your baby. Or more so the doctor, that is. But, going back to the topic... They work by binding to specific receptors on the surface of cells, triggering various cellular responses. For example, some prostaglandins can relax or tighten blood vessels, while others can influence pain and inflammation, and some are involved in the healing and repair processes. You can think of prostaglandins as messages in the body that help manage how cells respond to an injury, illness, or stress, similar to how sending out an email with instructions to different departments in a company tells them what to do, in various situations and circumstances. But when it comes to hair loss, there are prostaglandins that are good for, you know, keeping hair in a state of growth, and then there are prostaglandins that are typically bad and lead to inflammation, oxidative stress, and eventually the miniaturization of the hair follicle. According to the literature review titled, quote, Does Prostaglandin D2 Hold the Cure to Male Pattern Baldness? unquote, by Ashley Neves and Dr. Luis A. Garza. According to the literature review, prostaglandins such as PGF2-alpha and PGE2 are known to support hair growth, whereas prostaglandin D2 or PGD2 is associated with the inhibition of hair growth or the prevention of hair growth. The review specifically states that, quote, prostaglandins often have opposing functions, unquote, which goes to show that while PGD2 inhibits hair growth, other prostaglandins like PGE2 and PGF2-alpha stimulate it. PGD2 specifically has a negative impact in cases of androgenetic alopecia, where it binds to the GPR44 receptor, also known as the prostaglandin D2 receptor, in hair follicles, which leads to shorter hair growth cycles due to a host of downstream effects coming from result of binding to this receptor. This prostaglandin D2 receptor essentially acts as a docking station for PGD2, triggering signals that, again, inhibit hair growth. So essentially, while we have other receptors like PGE2 and PGF2 analogs, those bind to their respective receptor sites, and they can stimulate the hair follicle such that it grows hair. So it really goes to show how bad PGD2 is and how potentially, when we have issues with alopecia of any kind, we want to decrease PGD2 where we can. And curiously enough, even in the case of minoxidil, it's theorized to utilize prostaglandins like PGE2 to aid in hair growth. And we get this understanding from the study titled, quote, activation of cytoprotective prostaglandin synthesis 1 by minoxidil as a possible explanation for its hair growth stimulating effect, unquote, by Bernard et al., 1997. And it's in this particular paper that found minoxidil activating an enzyme known as prostaglandin endoperoxide synthesis 1, or PGHS1, also known as COX-1 or COX-1. Get your mind out of the gutter, okay? <laughs> Which leads to increased production of PGE2, playing a significant role in promoting hair growth. So this enzyme, again, this enzyme PGHS1, Primarily, it's found in the dermal papilla of the hair follicles. So that is at the literal base of the hair follicle. I'll try to show some graphics over here on the screen. But this is the sort of power plant of the hair follicle, where if you can stimulate it correctly, you can get further cell type differentiation that ultimately builds the hair out of the hair follicle. PGHS1 can also convert its substrate into PGD2 under certain genetic triggers, such as increased DHT levels in androgenetic alopecia. So PGHS1, or COX-1, same enzyme here that we're talking about, is an enzyme that can either lead to the production of good prostaglandins like PGF2-alpha or PGE2, but it can also turn into the bad prostaglandin boogeyman that we're talking about, PGD2. It mostly depends on the genetic conditions that are being initiated from some sort of other, you know, environmental trigger. And that trigger would activate the genes that can either express more of those good prostaglandins or more of those bad prostaglandins. 
But the story is like this, right? PGHS1 or COX1 converts aerosodonic acid into prostaglandin H2 or PGH2. Then PGH2 is metabolized by specific enzymes to create various prostaglandins. So it's now going to branch off into the either good prostaglandins or bad prostaglandins. So it depends on what genes are being activated by certain cells or certain processes that either turn on specific enzymes to kind of differentiate into the good prostaglandin tree or the bad prostaglandin tree or really essentially there is no good or bad it depends on the condition that you're dealing with but i'll just break it down that way right you need certain enzymes to be activated that will either give you the pgd2 branch or the pge2 and pgf2 alpha branch so in order to get the pgd2 enzyme an enzyme known as prostaglandin d synthase or PGDS converts PGH2 into PGD2. Now, there are two isoforms of PGDS. One, the lipocalin type or the LPGDS type. And the second one is the hematopoietic type or the HPGDS, which are used depending on the cell type and tissue. Up next, prostaglandin E synthase or PGES converts PGH2 to PGE2. Like PGDS, there are different isoforms of PGES, including the microsomal PGES1, PGES2, and cytosolic PGES, which all vary based on their cellular location, tissue type, and other sort of regulatory functions. Prostaglandin F synthase, or PGFS, converts PGH2 to PGF2-alpha. This enzyme also exists in different forms, including aldose reductase, which plays a role in converting PGH2 to PGF2-alpha in certain tissues. So going back to the study by Bernard et al., it suggests that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs, blocks and reduces PGHS1, also known as COX-1, COX-1. So in observing this mechanism of action, a key component of minoxidil's mechanism, which involves the use of prostaglandins for hair growth suggests that the use of NSAID drugs like aspirin may hinder minoxidil's efficacy because it interacts with PGHS1 aka COX1 and reduces or blocks the use of those particular enzymes. And if those enzymes aren't in abundance then you're not even going to get as much PGD2 or PGE2 altogether. And minoxidil in that respect could very well have its efficacy hindered. And also, just as a side note, I think it's also important to kind of take in genetic variation into account. Somebody may have genes that are just more inclined to produce PGD2, which could put them at a predisposed risk for other health conditions and even certain hair loss conditions as well. And likewise, the same thing could be said for PGE2, right? Even having too much PGE2, which we'll touch on later on in the video, that can be bad for you.